Hey everyone, welcome to the Nerd Stalker Tech Week podcast. We are here, and I am Adolfo Ferranda at Nerd Stalker on Twitter. And I'm Greg Gloria at Social Greg on Twitter. Hey man, how's hey it man. going? Good, good, thanks. How about you? Well, okay, I heard you were a little bit under the weather. This week, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Uh, we'll take it easy on you. You'll hear me coughing through this, people. <laughs> I apologize in advance <laughs> it's okay. for the hacking. <laughs> it's okay. Hey! You have a Facebook uh, thing on a tweet that I saw about uh, YouTube and Vivo. Let's talk about that. Yeah, so Greg Sandoval of CNET's reporting this, um, you know, that some of his sources are telling him that Facebook has held talks with Vivo about moving the music video service away from YouTube and over to the social network wow. to uh, Facebook. Now, um, this is huge news, obviously, because whenever you go watch a video site now, music videos on YouTube, it seems to go right to this Vivo thing, right? So... Anyway, so sources said that their discussions are uh, really pre preliminary at this point and noted that there's still another year remaining on Vivo's contract with YouTube. But uh, mm. meetings have occurred mm. between Vivo and Facebook at least twice. Uh, the most recent talks took place in the past two weeks, uh, the, their sources said. Facebook is interested in a similar arrangement uh, to the one Vivo now has with Google YouTube. Google's YouTube. Facebook would stream Vivo's music videos and the two companies would sell ads and share in the profits, which that's where the, the money is, right? Here's the most compelling mm. uh, uh, thing a Vivo deal could offer Facebook. CEO Mark Zuckerberg could offer free music listening in the form of music videos, just like YouTube does now to the company's users. Uh, that would certainly help Facebook keep users on the site longer, something that the company is determined to do. That's a big goal for Facebook. They already do an outstanding job of it, but you know this would help also. When it comes to uh, growth potential, consider that Vivo has only been in business two full years, which is a little shocking to me, but the video service was second only to YouTube in the number of uniques. Um, so wow. 130 million to 43 million, respectively, according wow. to Nielsen. Whoever uh, Vivo partners with, the company will likely insist on maintaining a significant amount of control, obviously. Uh, so they were launched in 2009. Vivo offers music videos from three of the top four record companies, Universal, Sony, and yeah. EMI. Yeah, it's incredible. <clears throat> YouTube helped the video, uh, create Vivo's back end, and Vivo's videos are best known for appealing to YouTube, interestingly enough. Uh, Doug Morris, then the leader of Universal Mu Music Group, who is now operating rival Sony Music, was the man who pushed the idea to Vivo. Uh, Morris always wow. believed that the recording industry goofed in the early 1980s when it gave them away for free to MTV. The labels could only watch ah. as the cable channel went on to build a dynasty around them. Vivo's purpose is to make sure that the labels don't miss out on the next crazy music videos, and they look like they're doing an outstanding job of that at this point. But hey, Greg, know your phone, or yes. else. The case of the Philharmonic <laughs> Interrupter, what is this? <laughs> oh, well, I, I, um, one week on a Tuesday um, in uh, New York's Avery Fisher Hall, uh, you know, packed house. Um, you know, this is from GeekWire, by the way. Um, a, a packed house listened to the renowned conductor Alan Gilbert, uh, who uh, led the New York Philharmonic through Mahler's Ninth Symphony. You know, really, it's a masterpiece considered to be one of the most moving and reflective of all music. Um, it, then in the fourth movement, uh, neared its conclusion close to where the music and silence is almost indistinguishable. I mean, it just goes to like a, it goes from a, cre a loud crescendo down to almost nothing. Oh, yeah. A uh, person, an attendee's uh, iPhone. Um, started playing the marimba alarm. Oh yeah. my god! <laughs> and, oh, and everyone, in, you know, I mean, you know, everyone in the whole hall heard it, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, it was going. Dun, 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 oh, no. dun, 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 what know? a nightmare! <laughs> and it kept on chiming. And so it was this funny. The the conductor finally turned around after he heard this thing, right? And he stared at the person who. Who obviously his phone's going out, wow. and um, you know everyone is just heckling this guy at at, at the symphony. You know, say, hey, you know, kick his ass out. Oh you know, give God. him a fine. You know, all that stuff. That and, so and, and 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 the sad part about it is that apparently, you know, um, they call they call they call this guy Patron X because he was he was actually interviewed by the New York Times after this whole incident happened, and and you know you know. He, he he he's a 60 year old man who runs like two companies, so he's very influential, you know, wow. in his own right. But 
but he had just replaced his BlackBerry with his iPhone the day before. Oh. <laughs> so it's like, it's like, you know, there's, you know, it, I'm kind of thinking about like, wow, what if I got into that situation? You know, it's like I got a new phone or like, like mm. the opposite. I, I replaced my Android with a BlackBerry, God mm-hmm. forbid. Mm-hmm. But, but, <laughs> but, but like if I didn't know how to use any of those alarm functions or whatever, boy, I'd be screwed too, you know? So, I, mm. you know, it was kind of almost sad. Bad, actually, uh, this was an interesting tweet I saw from you this week. Uh, teenagers sharing passwords as a show of affection. That's interesting. Yeah. So teenagers sharing passwords. Yeah. From the New York Times this is where this one comes from an author mm. named um, Matt Rictel. Um, mm. So what he's saying is it, it's become fashionable for young people to express their affection for each other by sharing their passwords to their email, Facebook, and other accounts. How bizarre is this? Ooh. Boyfriends and girlfriends Whoa. sometimes Whoa. even create identical passwords to let each other read their private emails and texts. Uh, it's a sign of trust, apparently, according to <laughs> Tiffany Karing Dang, a high school senior in San Francisco. Man. She said a decision she uh, and her boyfriend made several years ago uh, to share share passwords for email and Facebook. I have, she says, I have uh, nothing to hide from him and he has nothing to hide from me, unquote. But it doesn't always end so well, of course. Changing a password is, is uh, password is simple, uh, but students, uh, counselors and parents say the damage is often done before a password is changed or that the sharing of online lives can be the reason uh, of a relationship failure, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. Stories of fallout mm-hmm. include a spurned boyfriend in junior high who tries to humiliate his ex-girlfriend by sp- spreading her email secrets, tensions between significant others, scouring over each other's private messages for clues of disloyalty, grabbing cell phone from a former best friend, unlocking it with a password, and sending threatening text to someone. So th- some of those are uh, the horror stories. Um, in a 2011 telephone survey, the Pew Internet and American Life Project found that 30% of teenagers who were regularly online had shared a password with a friend, boyfriend, or girlfriend. The uh, survey of 770 teacher, uh, teenagers aged 12 to 17 found that the girls <laughs> were almost twice as likely as boys to share. And in more than two dozen interviews, parents, students, and counselors said that the practice had become widespread. How awful is that, man? I'm glad I was a kid when I was a kid. <laughs> Dude, wow. I, well, you know, there's a lot of statistics out there that, like, you know, there's a lot of breakups due to Facebook, um, you know, or Facebook is mentioned in, <laughs> in the in the proceedings for divorce, which is I thought it was kind of funny, but you know, that type of social media yeah. stuff, you know, comes up now, you know, and that's right, emails, uh, you know, yeah. you know, I, you know, the the this whole thing with social media and relationships is really kind of fascinating because. You know, there there is that trust thing, right? That they mentioned in, that you've been mentioned in that in that article, mm-hmm. and you know, um, you know, if you give your spouse that the key to the castle, is that is that good enough to feel that like you feel some very secure with your relationship and all that stuff? So, right. You know, there's a couple of debates you could say one way or another with all that. But, you know, but, as if it's not tough know, enough I, being a teenager in these days, you know, uh, let alone adults mm-hmm. and and their crazy lives, but. But a yeah, teenager, I yeah. mean, this is a whole other, you know, thing. And, and this is becoming, I mean, this trend is on the increase. It's not on the decrease. So on to bigger news. Oh, I think it's big news. Jerry Yang's decision to yeah. leave Yahoo was his own, even if it was inevitable. Oh, yeah. Kara Swisher from All Things Digital, a great, great writer. Yeah, um, yeah she wrote a piece about, uh, you know, kind of analyzing uh, kind of the, the backstories to, you know, Jerry Yang leaving uh, Yahoo uh, this last week. Um, you know, uh, you know, there's been a lot of issues about, you know, um, you know, him being on certain boards of companies that they're trying to do partnerships with, you know, Alibaba and stuff like that. Right. And, you know, you know, one thing that that I've always heard uh, from friends that have been at Yahoo as well as, you know, other ex-employees that, you know, they, they, they did respect uh, Jerry as a co-founder uh, from the employee standpoint. You know, he was really involved in a lot of meetings, but I think as as the Yahoo uh, ship started to tilt, <laughs> I think a lot of that has, has gone down. Um, a lot of board members um, – you know, we're really loudly saying, I mean, publicly saying that his his presence in these board meetings was a problem. Uh, you know, um, uh, Daniel Loeb, uh, who was, you know, really a really 
a, a big shareholder of Yahoo was calling for his ouster. So, um, you know, and, you know, be fair or not fair, you know, I think, you know, um, the problems of Yahoo has been always kind of focused on, you know, uh, Jerry Yang being a CEO, right? So I think, uh, you know, I think he was, he's trying to just kind of distance himself now, get, get out of the, you know, the spotlight of all these problems and just kind of, you know, exist in another, another venue. I don't know what he's going to do moving forward, but, um, you know, Yahoo has so many problems anyway. You know, I think it's just, it's just one of the one of the things when a company's going into problems, you know, one of the founders finally leave that just kind of, you know, kind of almost put a fork in it, right? So, um, anyway, um, talk about uh, cutting it into pieces. Uh, Google's still uh, cleaning house, huh? Still cleaning house. Focusing <laughs> is what they call it, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, this one comes from Google themselves. Google's killing uh, some apps. Actually, they're merging them um, and doing all kinds of stuff with these things. Um. So Google messaging uh, continuity is one of the things that they launched, uh, an email disaster recovery product for enterprise customers. I see. I'll just go through the list of some of these. Google Sky Map, which was an app that was created by half a dozen Googlers at the Pittsburgh office in their 20% time. And um, Needlebase, which uh, they're retiring, a data management platform. And Picnic, which was uh, acquired... Uh, they acquired this online photo editor uh, back in 2010. They're retiring the service so the Picnic team can continue creating photo editing magic across a Google products is what they say. Wow. Um, wow. So they're, they're allowing the Picnic users to take a zip of their creations and get them out <laughs> or copy wow. them to Google+. Wow. Right. Uh, right. Social, uh, so something called the Social Graph API. So this hmm. API makes uh, information about the public connections between people of the web available for developers. The API isn't experiencing the, do the kind of adoption they'd like, so um, it's being deprecated as of the day of the posting. It's uh, to be fully retired by April 20th of this year. Sorry. And finally, yeah. in Urchin, in 2005, uh, they acquired Urchin, oh. uh, whose online web analytics product became the foundation for Google Analytics. Uh, this is being phased right. out. They're using another system. Urchin has been downloaded, and they're going to no longer be available for uh, after March 2012. So it's going away quick. I see. So it's yeah, fascinating. I was wondering how they do all these. Yeah, I wonder how they do all these phase outs. I, I was thinking the other day. I was talking to my friend at People Browser, and mm -hmm. um, you know, he, he they create uh, APIs, mm -hmm. you know, and. And the the one concern as uh, like maybe on the agency side where I could use APIs to get information and stuff mm -hmm. like that, you know, are we talked in a couple of podcasts about changes, but what about total disconnections? You know, phase out of the products. You know, um, that really would would send anyone dependent on any API. Let's just forget about Google at this point. Yeah. I think those APIs that they got rid of. I I, I haven't really heard much about them until mm -hmm. you mentioned them earlier. Um, is a kind of an interesting issue, isn't it? That if, you know, if a product <laughs> really depends on an API and the company decides to cancel it or, you know, they go yeah. out of business, yeah. uh, <laughs> that's a really interesting problem, isn't it? <laughs> I know. Well, there's been some positive signs. I know. Um, uh, back a few episodes, we talked about the oh, the killing of uh, the Android app maker and that they were supposedly going to eventually um, open source it. Right. Well, they have open sourced it and it's been released officially by I forget who it is MIT or someone like that. Now that they um, they mm, gave it to. Mm. And what's interesting yes, also yes. is here they mentioned Google Sky Map and they said the app the that app was created by you know twenty percent time to offer a window into the sky, right, for first-generation Android phones. And uh, so right. they're saying that the Sky Map and collaborate. Um, is it going to be given, I think, to Carnegie Mellon in a partnership. We'll see further development, SkyMap, as a, an open source wow. project also. So it's hopeful that some of these things will kind of, you know, live on in an open source sort of realm and take a life of their own. But, yeah, you're absolutely correct. APIs and other applications, things like that, if you're dependent on them, and if it's a labs type of product or anything like that, you, yeah. you know, you really cannot, cool. it seems like, have a whole lot of faith in a production type of release. Well, yeah, absolutely. And I think that um, when I was talking to my friend at People Browser again, he, he said that, you know, they always get questions from their users about updates, uh, changes, and stuff like that, mm. especially if um, certain features are, are changed. Right? What, what does that really mean to the 
to the end user, right? Um, getting information for the API, yeah. and, and and I talked to a lot of developers. That, in fact, you know, at companies. In fact, none of that communication even happens sometimes, right? So that must it be just really tough because I know people browsers are so dependent on the Twitter API as for part of their product. Absolutely, and um, you know. It it doesn't help if they change some things yeah. and they're not notified and I and I don't I'm not sure even how if they manage are. it, but that, <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah even if they are my friend yeah. you're absolutely right tough, but man. wow that was good. that was a good article so yeah, great for sure Microsoft uh, yes what's what's going on with Microsoft well I, I just saw this this bug early this morning and I just wanted to mention it this looks like uh, Microsoft acknowledged that the Xbox 360 has a color space problem in the last update uh, uh, Richard L yeah Richard Lawler uh, from Engadget uh, mentioned that uh, just uh, the other day um, you know uh, you know the, there was this thing called the dashboard upgrade uh, uh, to the last Xbox 360 um, update and um, you know not everyone was happy after it finally rolled out in December, but uh, when received word from multiple owners who saw reported color output problems since the beta began, uh, today Director of Programming Larry Herb, uh, a.k.a. Major Nelson, uh, tweeted that the company is aware of the color space issue with some Xbox video apps and are working on a fix. Um, well, that should take probably some care of some of the issues. Most recent reports indicate it's a problem with the HDMI output. Uh, having you know, some authentication problems with certain TVs, <laughs> isn't that ugly? Oh, wow. I, I, you know, again, it's another one of those things I mentioned like earlier uh, about APIs. It's a product management issue, right? Uh, is that with with all these devices that could hook into your app or your 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 box, um, you know, you have to test all those things, wouldn't you think? But mm. you know, I could see where a company um, needs to hit the market window. They kind of you know, Boy, the beauty of being Apple, right? If you can control your whole hardware and software all the way down the vertical, right? That's exactly what I'm going going to with that because I think that's <laughs> that's why it's really that's why you know Apple is positioned perfectly, right? Mm -hmm. Because they don't have to worry about that; they're in total control of all that. Okay, let's go on. Um, Guild Group is uh, laying off some people there. Yeah, the darlings of the uh, you know of the upper class, right? I mean. Yes. Layoffs underway yes. at Guild Group right now, uh, according to Beta B. Uh, general atmosphere is quote terrifying. By N and this is uh, brought to us by Natasha Tiku. Last Wednesday, Beta, Bre Beta Bre Beat broke the news. Try to say that three times fast. Um, of impending <laughs> yeah. layoffs you, at Guild Group. Speaking Swedish. <laughs> yeah. Later that morning, CEO <laughs> Kevin Ryan downgraded the estimates. Uh, we had heard is what they're saying, uh, telling All Things D that the company intended to quote selectively trim about 50 people from its staff of over 900 over the next couple months. Tipsters have written into Beta Beat uh, that some of those layoffs were currently underway. People leaving sadness, super uncomfortable work environment, uh, you know, general down downer, said one source who uh, wanted to remain anonymous, adding, general atmosphere is terrifying, unquote. But if it's your livelihood, I can understand that. Um, sure. Guild Group raised a hundred and thirty eight million in the Series E round uh, wow. just last May. And yeah. in addition to launching new verticals acquired Buy With Me last October, prior to the acquisition, Buy With Me made its own layoffs, letting go of nearly half the staff in order to make the company more attractive to buyers. As Mr. Right. Ryan indicated, some of the uh, 20 to 25 Buy With Me staffers that came over to Guilt as part of the deal may be among those let go, as they quote, they probably don't need that many going forward now that the integration has been um, completed, unquote, paraphrased all things D. Another vertical that Mr. Ryan indicated might experience cuts is Guilt Taste. Since mm. reporting the layoffs at Guilt Group, a number of other players in the luxury Luxury good and deals daily deal space have let go of staffers, including Rula Law, which cuts 60 staffers at Lot 18, a guilt taste competitor. What's particularly of interest uh, I, to me in this story is mm -hmm. this, uh, mm -hmm. this, this was sort of the untouchable market. You know, this was the can do no harm in a recession market, it's selling to the right, upper class right. or the wealthy or whatever, right? right. And here, right. And, and here we have this sort of indication uh, of trimming down. So, Greg, you so, found a real a huge yes. story actually that we're touching on uh, again that sort of bubbled up. I, and I'm glad you you're bringing it up. Is why Google Search Plus is a bigger deal than you think? 
Yeah, um, it, this story uh, came from a, a blogger that I follow fairly well called Social Steve, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it, yeah, so I guess I follow a bunch of the social uh, name guys. <laughs> so anyway, um, you know, uh, it's you know, CES was such a big thing last week. There was all this stuff in News Channel that this this story kind of quietly crept up before CES and then never really hit a crescendo. Is you know. Uh, Google's new Search Plus, um, you know, uh, aka um, I forget what they call that. There, there's some, um, you know, um, Spy W or something like that. So, hmm. um, you know, you know, this new search feature is is interesting. So let me kind of describe it for you guys. Um, so let's say you search for something like bicycles, and uh, um, in the Search Plus, your world, which they kind of call this capability, means that like. Any profiles, business pages, uh, Picasso photos, uh, Google Plus posts, comments that include bicycle or bike uh, or tagging automatically appears in the top of your search queue now. And right, it, you know, before when you used Google search, it was kind of like based on SEO results and it was kind of like genericized across the whole uh, spectrum, right? Here now, Google is then prioritizing, you know, your, you know, search results on the Google Plus and or on Google. Um, so, you know, PC World kind of said, hey, wait a minute, guys. You know, so they wrote an article called Google Search Plus Your World, uh, what it means for users. Um, and they, 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 they expressed some concerns about uh, Google prioritizing its own content, right? And, and that's what really kind of lit this fuse in, in the world of, like, eh, you know, Twitter saying, hey, yeah, I, I, you know, we're, we're not really happy with that and, and all that stuff. So, but, but I think uh, what this uh, writer, uh, uh, Social Steve, did, uh, which I thought was point on, it's what, what Google is doing right now is, is changing the search to more contextual relevance for us individuals, right? So, like, if I'm searching for bikes or I want to go get a, a, a new keyboard or whatever, and, and, and a bunch of my friends are, are musicians and they've said something on their, their network about, you know, the certain keyboards that they liked, right? Uh, those are the, probably the information I want to get first anyway because I, I trust my friends, I trust my community, and sure. if their, their content comes up, um, I probably want to read that first anyway. Um, sure. So uh, what he what he's saying is that it's kind of a game changer from a standpoint of us individuals to be a more contextual search than a global search. So uh, I thought that was kind of an interesting point he pointed out in his blog there. So you know catch catch it on Social Steve. I'll, we'll put the link up. But I, I thought I thought that was a good thought piece on on this new search thing. Any mm -hmm. any comments? <laughs> yeah, I follow uh, someone named Danny Sullivan who has the SEO blog, right? Who actually uh, oh, oh. has been a big proponent actually of Google for a long time. He's a Google defender, mm. and uh, he mm. has some issue with this. Um, okay, <clears throat> the big one being that it it uh, it's preferential to Google Plus, which is a huge issue, yeah. right? Um, so yeah. they've never really sort of uh, Google has never really prioritized any of their products, and uh, Google oh, Plus is now getting preferential treatment, and. Um, so the thing is, is if you do a search back in the day, you could be, you know, you get a global search and you get kind of global results and things like that based on right. different right. things. Yeah, but SEO, yeah, was big influence and and you can, you know, work it in that sort of respect. But now there's a couple mm -hmm. things, you know, mm -hmm. uh, especially a huge one is localization. So you're going to get results based on where you're at, you know. So we're going to get results prioritized by San Francisco. Right. So. Right. Right. Now this sort of pure search is gone, right? And not only that, it's like now it's prioritized also with Google Plus sort of results too. The uh, only way to get out right, of it right. is to use incognito mode in Chrome. And um, mm. so it, it's it's kind of until they get the, and what they're saying is, hey, Facebook won't give us their info. You know, Twitter won't give give us their info. Although they, they <laughs> yeah. could get it, right? It's um Yeah, right. There is a way to get it, but officially it's not not supported by the others, obviously. Um, a fascinating thing about this too is Bing's been doing this for some time now. Actually, they have a deal in place oh, with Facebook, yes. so they've been they've been doing this long before Google's doing it. But for whatever reason, Google, mm -hmm. being the huge search engine, is getting all this press for it, and although some of it negative too. And I can understand why it changes it changes mm -hmm. the SEO game completely. This is huge, huge news, and people don't really realize it unless you're in the in the web game in some respects. So social, as you said, Greg, or from the web development yeah. business marketing perspective, 
This is huge um, because it's going to mean you have to have a Google Plus page now. You is just no going around it. You know, you have to if you're a business or you're a whatever entrepreneur or anything. If you don't have a Google yeah. Plus page now, you're crazy because that's going to sort of help with your search results. And and we all want to, you know that Google juice, right? Obviously. Yeah. So so it's a big well, big I, deal. Yeah, I heard you could actually turn them off. Uh, apparently, I, I'll we'll post that uh, PC World uh, article that I had, but it'll tell you how to do it. But there's a, there's apparently a way to turn it off, uh, which I was kind of surprised. But I guess you know that that kind of was their way of saying, hey, you know, we understand that people are used to the regular way of searching, and but you know, are people going to do that? You know, I guess the jury's out. You know, who knows so, how to go in, into incognito mode. You know, on the Mac, it's yeah. what is it? Control <laughs> exactly. Shift N or something, right? <laughs> Incognito move. Oh my! And why? God. Why is our? Yeah, why so, are our moms or grandma going to go? No, no way. You have to get a Google Plus page today. You know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I agree with you there. I think. I, I think. You know, it's an interesting play, right, on Google's part. I yeah. mean, you know, they're so big. Yeah, I was always wondering, when what are they going to do to leverage? you know, the big behemoth they are, right? <laughs> well, this is, you know, going, go, yeah. this, this reminds me of the days when uh, Microsoft just decided, you know, we need to kill Mozilla. What are we going to do? We're right. going to throw in IE in our operating system natively That's with right. the operating system. It's going to be baked right in. That's right. No need to install right. anything. Right. You got it. Yeah. <laughs> dead. That's a good point. Mozilla, dead, that right? That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So now with, with uh, Search, too, it's like, you know, we Google Plus. How are we going to get people to use it? And everyone, you know, if we're getting killed by Facebook, you know, we're we're losing all of that social graph uh, data that will, you know, yeah. to them, and Twitter right, to some extent right. too, right? And so now it's like this. It's a hell of a punch back. But the thing is, like all you people who've been throwing in keywords and meta tags and doing you know content optimization, <laughs> you know, hoping to get you know these right, huge right. footer like uh, with all these links in it to try to get some sort of keyword juice. You've just right. been hosed. <laughs> to some extent here. Tip time, tip time, tip time, tip time, water time. <laughs> oh God, yeah. Get some water for you to do your tip. <laughs> I think we're gonna do a, we'll we'll do Adolfo's tip first. Yeah, today. man. So yeah. What do you got there, man? This tip is called I Boost Up. This one's thanks to Lifehacker for this tip. Uh I boost nice. up cleans out your Mac system file clutter in a minute. I got a lot of uh responses to this one when I tweeted it. A lot of people are very interested in mm. this. It's just one of those really simple applications. It's on um, the iOS App Store or whatever you call it, the App Store, the Mac App Store that comes on your machines now. Nice. It's for OS X, obviously. iBoost Up cleans out the crap on your drive and fine-tunes your system for better performance. It's simple, and it's really fast, and it's free, which is great. iBoost Up's UI is uh, pretty simple, straightforward. Um, you initially bought, uh, brought to a status page that gives you the system overview, plus a look at what scans you've run and when. You can click over any of the scans to run them or access additional options via the sidebar to left. Quick scan option is what will interest you the most people as it uh, can save a good chunk of hard disk space in a minute. And true enough, I ran this thing you know, right before the show, and it was already offering to save up about two and a half gigs on my machine. So, uh, and it was super fast. I didn't run it because I don't want it to blow away all my uh, my caching and, and uh, cookies quite yet right before the show and of recording course. and everything. Of course. But, it, it, oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> a lot of people dig it, you know. it's But, you know, you can find a lot of these sort of utility apps, but for whatever reason, this one's getting a lot of buzz right now. So, you know, hey, give it a try. Ooh, I'm going to give that. it a try after the show, and I'll let you know if um, you know, if we don't record next <laughs> yeah. week. It's because it's destroyed my machine. <laughs> Good tip, though. I like that. I like yeah. that. Um, How about you, Greg? But, but anyway, I, I got my – got Hey, we're doing something new, the Drippler. Uh, so I got my Social Greg's Drippler tip of the week. So, all right, you know, all right, Drippler. Uh, Give you some background on uh, Drippler. They're they're the they're a, a web app that allows you to get uh, news about devices that you like. Uh, it could be a iOS 4s. Um, it could be the um, you know the the iPad 2. It could be a you know an Android uh, you know, device. So um, they're a really good site. We'll put the uh, link to there. But um, th one thing that caught my eye on the Drippler site this week was uh, 10 ones design. Um, Magnus will make your iPad stand up. So basically, what it is, it's it's a it's a it's a um, aluminum stand that has some mm. heavy duty magnets in there. Oh, very cool! That I've allows seen you to hold up your iPad and it just basically it's a stand. Yeah. It's very simple. I thought I I, I love the simplicity, yeah. the the design of it all. It's pretty. And, um, yeah. You know, I, I guess if we used uh, iPads uh, for our um, our studio here, I guess. 
um, I would use one of those, I guess. Oh, so, you don't, um, Greg? I'm, I'm surrounded by iPads right now. I actually use iPads for all my lighting <sighs> here. Sigh. <laughs> <laughs> That's where all our money goes. <laughs> oh yeah that's true that's right uh, okay that's why i'm not paid that much I guess. okay <laughs> great tip Greg. great tip though <laughs> yeah thanks man thanks, and thanks man. dribbler man. So, yeah dribbler's really cool though because i i put in actually the uh the gadgets that i own you know i put in my droid x yes. and i get all kinds of yes. awesome like droid news and stuff like that which i've tweeted numerous times so mm -hmm, yeah mm -hmm. very cool great yeah tip. i think we'll continue to do that so um, i'll look for the dripler t uh, tip every week so anyway uh what's uh, coming up on the uh, event page there's my friend event we have the node summit we are the media a media partner for the node summit here in san francisco which is a two-day conference at the mission bay conference center in san francisco january 24th through 25th that's this tuesday and wednesday please be there it's going to be great and get more information at nodesummit.com for all you people that love or are interested in, or you should learn about Node.js, check it out. Entrepreneurs, developers, uh, everyone, go check it out. You want to you wanna find out this is a definitely upcoming business sort of uh, thing that you want to be in on, on the ground level. And this is a great early time to get in, and this is going to be the first big one. The creator of Node himself will be there. It's going to be fantastic. How about you, wow. Greg? Hey, uh, we got SF New Tech this week on the 25th, uh, January 25th, Wednesday um, at uh, 119 Utah Street, you, uh, the Mighty uh, Club. So uh, as, it, as it always is, uh, the first 2012 event. <laughs> and so we're going to see, meet and see Tetras, IQ Engines, Cappy, uh, heard about uh, RAVN, and, and more. So um, yeah, just go to SFNewTech.com. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I, I thought I, I got to see what these guys are all about. Yeah. <laughs> You're scaring me, man. <laughs> uh, but anyway. Um, it's all the yeah. Ricola. But, it's just uh, making me hot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Methanol. <laughs> no. Uh, mm. I, anyway, um, so I, I think uh, well, I, I'll be streaming that night. So, uh, you know, get on to uh, Ustream and um, listen to my broadcast uh, through the B Tracks channel, uh, SME Tech channel, and uh, we're going to have some fun. Cool. Be there or be square. Awesome, yeah. man. And a uh, reminder to everyone, you can uh, contribute to NerdStalker by using the hashtag, hashtag NRDSTK on Twitter. And uh, check us out at NerdStalker.com. Uh, check us out on iTunes. You can subscribe to our audio or video podcast. And please leave us a, ra a rating. That really helps us out. And go to our YouTube channel. And uh, if you want to find us there, just do a search for NerdStalker TV, all one word, NerdStalker TV. And... Um, Anyways, I am Adolfo. You can reach me at Adolfo at Gmail, at Gmail, Adolfo at NerdStalker.com or at NerdStalker on Twitter. How about you, Greg? You can reach me on email at SocialGregSF at Gmail.com or on Twitter uh, at SocialGreg. Um, you know, look me up and, uh, and we'll enter, and we'll, uh, we'll talk on Twitter. So anyway, awesome, thanks, man. man. That was good. Yeah. That was real good. Hopefully I won't so, be uh, hacking on have everyone a good week next out week. There. <laughs> Yeah, be careful out there. All right, right. see you guys.